Hello, and welcome to Why It Matters, Integration Unraveled, a Blueprint 1543 podcast. I'm Rebecca Dorsey, co-founder and vice president of Blueprint 1543. At Blueprint, our mission is to support the development of integrated people, integrated churches, and integrated inquiry to help people ask and answer some of life's biggest questions using the tools of the sciences and the Christian faith. The goal of this podcast is to ask, but why does integration matter in each of these areas, in everyday science of people's lives, in churches, and in inquiry? Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Jen Ripley, and she's potentially an integrated person. Today, we're going to go behind the scenes and talk about her real work and real approaches to some interesting and integrated ways of working. Now, to start us off, Jen, how did we meet and what is it that you do for a living? Hello. Thank you for having me on. I'm just really thrilled to get to be a part of, of the Integration Unraveled uh, group here that you're leading. I'm really impressed with what you're doing. Uh, we met in Knoxville at a Blueprint event that your team brought together just superstars of integration. I was just amazed at the people who came together to have conversations about what it means to live an integrated life, how we apply faith and the church, and particularly church-based kinds of uh, mental health care. And I'm very excited about all of that. So I was happy to kind of drop everything and come to a few days in Knoxville. And it ended up being very inspirational in my life, actually. So um, I can talk more about that later, perhaps. But uh, what I do for a living is I'm a professor. You are here in my office. Um, they, the uh, professor office is maybe not that exciting, but we, uh, I'm at Regent University and I am professor of psychology here. Right. I teach in a clinical psychology doctoral training program, and I am the co-director of the Karis Institute, which is an institute specifically focused on church-based interventions from a mental health perspective. And then I'm also the Hughes chair of integration. So my title has the word integration in it. Here's hoping that I actually am integrated. <laughs> now, that is an amazing piece of intel that I did not have when we asked you to do this. So this is going to make our interview even more fun. And it might be, I don't know, like a pop quiz along the way to see, you know, do we pass the integration in your title uh, test here? So that actually makes this even more fun to jump into. Now, just out of pure curiosity, how long have you been in that integration position? Just a few years. It was right before COVID. Um, that, and it's actually a co-chair position, which I think Dr. Jim Sells and I are co-directors of the Karis Institute. And we approached the university when the, when the chair was open and said, we would like to be co-chairs. And basically, the initial response was, there's no such thing as a co-chair. Like, <laughs> you're either a chair or you're not. And we said, but we think there can be. And they ended up agreeing with us. So I'm actually the co-chair, which is wonderful to get a chance to work as a team. I know you work as a team at Blueprint, but to get to work as a team together. So it's uh, been, been a few years, but it was really interesting because we got the position and we were, had all these great plans for church-based work. And then the world shut down for you know, over a year, but really two years in churches. And just the last year of churches are starting to do new things and move along. And so it's exciting to be a part of that. Yeah. And it sounds like you even took an integrated approach in being the integration co-chairs because you've gotten new perspectives that can be feeding into all of the work that you do. That's oh. right. Great. We're both marriage and family therapy trained. So family systems. So there's a lot of like, why wouldn't you co-chair things? But of course, two is better than one. Yeah. So I love that. Why wouldn't you integrate? Could be the question you turned back on them. So as we were thinking about how would we, who do we want to find to be part of this podcast on integration and what it looks like to live that out? You immediately came to mind from the interactions that we had with you at that event you're mentioning, which was the Psychology for Ministry Summit, 
where we brought together a bunch of psychologists and ministry leaders and pastors to be able to dig into some of the research and work of collaborating and integrating. So you immediately came to mind and we thought it would just be so fun to dig behind the scenes of some more of the work that you do, but also what motivates you to do the work that we do. One of the questions that we get asked a lot is why does integration matter? Why can't we just operate in parallel as we have multiple different parts that makes up anyone's personality, multiple different things that we care about and do? What is so important about our Christian faith and our discipline or our work being integrated? Why can't we just operate in parallel or in different compartments? And so in this podcast, we wanted to really dig into, well, what would more people say about this who are actually doing that? So that's some of where we're going to dig in. But before we get there, I'll just put that little placeholder in your mind. What made you interested in psychology in the very beginning as a profession? Absolutely. Well, we have to take the Wayback Machine to the early 90s to my college days. And I had two interests at the time. I really loved English literature and theater. And I was actually in my college theater productions. I got to play Ophelia, right? Like this was very exciting. But I also loved psychology. And uh, my father was an engineer. It's kind of very sciencey kind of way of thinking. And I was very attractive, attracted to that. And wanted to do something that would grow a field and in a scientific way. And um, so I was really stuck between these two. You can't do both, right? You have to make a choice. And I'm deeply pragmatic in the end. Um, and when I make decisions, I often make them in a pragmatic way. And I thought, you know, I think I'm just not quite good enough to make a career out of theater. Um, or even out of writing English literature. So if you're not amazing, you know, top 1%, then you are going to grade papers all your life, you know, English 101 papers. Or I could go into psychology and I felt like, I think I could do that. Like, I think I could teach and grade papers and advance research. And particularly, I have a really strong interest in, in uh, marriage and family and in religion, spirituality and Christian faith. And then I found Ev Worthington. So I'm in my final year of undergraduate. I read a book that he had written. He is probably the top person in Christian integration in my mind in the world. And he was working in marriage and family and in forgiveness. And he was just an hour away from my hometown in Richmond, Virginia. And I was just thrilled. I felt like it was just kismet. And so at that point, I really picked up the reins of psychology and said, okay, this is what I want to do. And fun fact, I did not get in the first time I applied and had to work for a year, but God was growing my maturity. I think it was a good thing for me to become a more mature person in that year before I started up in the doctoral program uh, where he was teaching. So that's what got me started. I, I love it. And it's, it's great to get to put together science and spiritual truths and realities into one space that is a real integrative space and i was so just thrilled about everything that's going on in christian psychology over the last 50 years or so yeah so how close is your <laughs> an actual life compared to what you thought it might be when you were waiting in that year to get into school and when you started Oh, I don't even know. Like, honestly, I started grad school and I was just like, oh, there's going to be an internship. Oh, OK. You know, but it's just like, but I mean, I get to be a psychology professor. Actually, one of the things that I thought was going to be awesome is I met Ed Worthington and he had just come back from playing tennis and he was like very casual. And I kind of wandered by his office and said, I want to meet you kind of thing. And I thought, oh this would be great. I can play tennis or which I don't play, but I can just like be super chill and relax and do all these fun things with my day. And that sounds like a great job. I totally want to be a professor. Right. And then I discovered, uh, I have to wear nice clothes and 
<laughs> to show up and work all day. I don't know where he found time to play tennis, but uh, that has not been my reality. I don't get that much time during the day to go off and do fun things. It was probably that one time fluke chance where there was some assignment he had had to do that involved tennis and that was the person. I don't know. I actually tease him that he's actually twins or or triplets because he has the capacity to do. I don't have the same capacity that he has. I have to work all day in order to produce the instance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's circle back to the question I prompted in your mind a few minutes ago then about integration. So what is the unedited first thing that comes to mind in general? If somebody said, why do you think it matters? to be integrated? I think you have like two choices, like you put forward. You can live a compartmentalized life. And it's not the worst thing in the world to be compartmentalized, you know? I mean, there are moments in my life when I am compartmentalized because something's happening in my personal life and yet I need to show up to work. I need to sit down with a family that I'm seeing in therapy. I, you know, and I have to just put it aside a little bit because I'm not ready yet to fully integrate what's been happening in my life with what I'm doing right now. And it can take some time. But that's second best, right? The best is when I have fully integrated that life experience. Maybe it's a painful one. Maybe it's a struggle. Maybe the world is not as it should be. Um, and I have been on my knees and, you know, and there are spatterings of you know, water from my face that have come come out in my life. Um, but when those experiences of grieving, of pain, when the experiences of confusion um, or embarrassment can move into my life and they can be made sense of by the God who sees me, by the God who loves me and knows everything that's going on in my heart and mind, in my family, in my city, and can move forward from there to be able to take that piece of me into my clinical work, into my teaching work, into my writing and my research. Uh, that's the best, um, that fully integrated life. I do not like to live a separated, compartmentalized life. Um, it, it, it is definitely second best, in my opinion. Yeah. So if we move then into the field of psychology, into doing work and what it could look like to be doing integrated work where the tools that you have as a, as a trained psychologist and the position of faith, the way that you're looking at the world, if you bring those things together, then what are some of the interesting things that can come out of being integrated from that faith perspective and your work? So walk me through some scenarios. What does it look like on the ground, practically speaking, to be an integrated science psychologist? Um, it's probably not that exciting. So hopefully I won't put all of your listeners to sleep now. But um, And I think the, some of that is to be inspired by um, the great ideas of Christianity as to what it is that I actually do in science. So I have studied marriage as one of my main ones. I always like to say the world began with a marriage and it ends with a marriage. Like that's the Christian story, right? The Adam and Eve story and the end of time with Christ and his bride. So I think marriage is important. Maybe I should study that. And so I've studied that and it's been my clinical area. I've studied hope. Um, and I think that hope is so central to the Christian story that we live in the now and not yet, that we have hope for things that we have not yet seen, that God will show up in the story, that there is an end to this story that is a good one and it is for our good. So I really enjoy that type of work. Um, I've studied uh, church-based kind of work as well. I, you know, get frustrated with the church, as I think we all do, um, when it's not living up to being, you know, the bride of Christ and the community of faith uh, as it should be. And there are plenty of instances of that lately to humble the church. But I also love the church and I love what it can be. I've had some of my 
most transformative moments there. And so the research that Jim and I are doing right now is specifically on church-based interventions for uh, mental health first aid type of thing. And so that is a great inspiration. So th that's one way of doing integration is which direction am I going to go? Like everything is from the Lord. You know what I mean? Like that God is the God of all things and we can study anything, right? And so people who study the stars and the moon, right? That is a beautiful uh, thing. So that I don't think that there's anything that's not able to be inspired by our Christian faith. But um, when I'm picking them myself, I try to go to like, okay, what's really central, you know, like marriage, family, the church, those are spaces. If I'm going to spend my brief life on something, then I'd like it to be on something that's very meaningful. So that's the piece of the puzzle. Um, I also try to live that integrated life in terms of how I live out my life with my students that I do devotionals in class and pray with students often. I see my work in graduate school as a discipleship role because I'm at a Christian institution. So there's space for that. Um, not all my students are Christians, um, but for those who are interested and even those that aren't, they tend to really, you know, I get like, I really like your prayers, you know, just like there's a real God that I'm really talking to who really loves these students more than could ever be measured. And um, and so really trying to understand their world, understand the pressures of that particular semester in their lives, in their personal lives, as well as in their academic life, it has been a really rewarding and exciting way to do integration. So there's that, you know, science side, but there's also that very personal side to sit with a student who's going through a breakup and trying to decide whether they should take their comprehensive exams and fell behind and even made a mistake, maybe made an, an you know, a morality mistake. Um, all those types of things happen and be able to sit and go, okay, where's God in this story? Um, and I really love and appreciate that. Um, and so that we as a team of faculty are building a system as much as we can in our human limitations where students can flourish in their faith as well as in their academic work and their clinical training. It's not an easy task, but uh, it is worth it. It's hard, but worth it, as most things are. So I'm going to try ways. <laughs> yeah, one of the things you shared at the start of that answer was about the inspiration of the topics of the work that you were doing around hope and some of the specific research that you're getting into. How do you think you've approached those topics because of your position of faith and the way that you see the world in ways that are maybe different than you see colleagues in researching hope, for example, or any of these other topics who are coming from a different position of faith? Yeah, um, it's really interesting. I like to think in terms of what inspires you to do the work that you do. And some of the things that I'm inspired by have come from explicitly Christian teaching or ideas. For instance, there's this really interesting sermon. It's out there on YouTube. You can go hunting for it. It's about empathic repentance. It's Larry Christensen. That's his name. Um, and it was like in the 1970s, a kind of a sermon. But he told the story of empathic repentance and it just did a great, you know, a good sermon, right? Stories around it. One about a, a, a guy who was held in a Nazi concentration camp who was mistreated and uh, beaten by his captor. And he what, was a believer and felt that God was telling him to empathize with his captor and what it was like for his captor there. And for him personally to repent for any time that he has taken his frustrations out on others or similar kinds of um, acts. How does, wow, that's inspiring. Like the kind of moral courage that it takes to be completely disempowered, completely alone, in prison, don't know whether you're going to live or die, and to have empathy for your captor, that was beautiful. I mean... That was so beautiful. I was very inspired by that story. And to begin to think like, 
okay, that's what it feels like in family conflict. You feel like you're trapped. You feel like this person's out to get to you. You feel like you are being harmed. Um, and everyone feels this in family conflicts. How do we inspire empathy in the midst of conflict? And in the end, it ends up being the upside down kingdom of God. It ends up that you in feeling like trapped, disempowered, and I can't do anything and I can't fix this by loving and empathizing with the other have the opportunity to actually become fully empowered by God for the work that you are called to do and the position in place and time you're in. That doesn't mean that you don't pursue justice when you should, right? That doesn't mean that the person's not being immoral in their activities. Um, so I'm not, you know, shooing that away. That's important. But what is our response as Christians? And uh, so that has been very inspirational in the REACH model. It inspired at Worthington. It inspired me. Um, uh, issues of humility around that have been inspiring with people like Steve Sandage. Uh, and so that one sermon actually inspired all of us. Um, and there's, so there's this like little backstory behind some of these things that we do that you realize, wow, this one idea that is so beautiful can like change my whole life and inspire me and create awe in me. And that's a great way to work. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather do that than trudge through the next, you know, regression analysis that I need to do. Yeah, yeah. You've shared then at a few different points in your trajectory or your career progression. Did you have a bit of a maybe transition period of going from less integrated work to more integrated work? Or has it gotten more comfortable or more smooth as you've gone along? Can you walk us through a little bit of what's the transition process of becoming an integrated researcher, an integrated uh, psychologist. Right. Yeah. So there's a theory in psychology religion uh, that people tend to be either bulwarks or sojourners. And so bulwarks are bulwarks of the faith. You know, they kind of hold steady like an anchor and sojourners kind of move around. And I thought until about four or five years ago that I was definitely a bulwark. I grew up in the, my faith tradition. I still have pretty much the same faith tradition as my parents. I've, I've been like, I wasn't one that took off on a prodigal run and had a very exciting story to tell. It was, you know, I was like, I'm kind of a bulwark. Okay. I accept that. It's not a very fun story, but it's, it's my story. And then about four or five years ago, I had a real conviction in my heart that I was getting colder and I was getting more distant and I was getting more rote in my personal faith life. And I started to get involved in some like very active prayer movements um, in some things like Renovare and 24 seven prayer. And it has revived me in ways I did not expect. I feel like I've been on a journey. I really do. Like the world just kind of opened up in whole new ways that I did not even think about before. What it means to pray multiple times a day, what it means to be on your knees, what it means to pray the Psalms, what it means to read, the, you know, some of the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Um, I've never, I've read Teresa of Avila like many years ago, I think probably in college. And I was like, this is the most boring thing in the whole wide world. Um, but okay. Yeah. You know, these this kind of desert mother way back in the medieval period. And then I read it recently and it is transformative. It is so beautiful. And so I really feel like, honestly, the Holy Spirit has just kind of come in and said, yeah, no more of that. It's time and just kind of blew up my heart. Um, and, you know, my students have noticed it. Sometimes my family has noticed it. Fortunately, my husband's gone through the same type of thing in the last five years. And um, I'm just so grateful for that, to be able to have this alive feeling in me and to be able to um, sense that there's something happening in the world that I'm a part of that God is doing 
and I have a small part, right? If you think of the world as a theater, I have a little small part. I'm going to come on, I'm going to say my one line, and then I'm going to go. And that's going to be my part. But uh, I'm just finding it so beautiful to watch. Watch it all and feel like I am a part of it and not just sitting in the audience watching it. So that, that's the, the honest truth of what's been happening in my life. And there's some pain involved in that and some stories, one of which my, my husband was involved in a mass shooting situation where he, a dozen of his workmates were killed. And um, it sent us to our knees um, that, you know, we, we've been through a trauma. He's been through it and me vicariously. And that really has sent us to our knees in ways that we never, never knew before. So that was five years ago. Yeah. Thank you for sharing some of that personal journey that you've been through. When you think about teaching and training students, mm -hmm. integrating and especially in your role as the co-chair of integration, how do you train or bring along students to live an integrated life? Yeah, living an integrated life as a student is really hard. I, I have a lot of, um, you know, art for the amount of work that's involved in being a doctoral student, and that's my area of teaching, is immense. And it is more than a person can do. I, every once in a while, I'll tell them, like, take all the books you're supposed to read this semester and articles and just try to stack them up. You know, it'll be like up to here. Can you do that? Some of them will be like, yeah, I can do it. And other ones are like, I don't think I can do it. You know? And um, and so it's so much. And um, so one of the things that I try to do with them is uh, to encourage Sabbath rest. That is something that has become very important to me in this personal revival time in my life is to just turn everything off for 24 hours. But at the same time, to be compassionate that particularly those who are also working outside jobs to be able to eat and have a place to live may not be able to find 24 hours. So what does it look like for them to rest? And I think while it seems odd, like the professor who's giving you work and is telling you to do all these things is also telling you to rest. Why? I think it's really important to have those kind of voices and to remind them that we are a part of Christianity. We are a part of a larger system. And while it all seems so important, we are not actually guarding nuclear secrets here and we can take a rest. And it's important to arrange your life in such a way that you're not going to burn yourself out. So that's a really important one that I try to do with students a lot. Um, and then also just to talk through their interests for research, their interests for clinical work. I supervise them clinically, so there's lots of opportunity there to even ask the question, this kind of client walked into your life. What the heck is God doing to you? You know, um, this is a very maybe blunt way of saying it, but, you know, more gentle way of saying, like, do you feel like maybe there's some kind of life lesson or personal growth point here in this clinical experience that you're having that's stretching and pushing and growing you in ways that you maybe didn't expect would happen. And those are some of the best times of grad school conversations that I get to have with students in supervision or in their dissertation or personal life when they can't find time to just rest a little. Important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've shared a good bit about your personal story in integration and what that looks like. You've shared about some of your research and some of your engagement with churches and what that looks like and about your students and helping them figure out their own topics and figure out how to also live that integrated life. Is there anything else that comes to mind that you think is a core piece of acting and living from this place of true integration? I do think there is one more important thing, and that is that sometimes I think it's important to do things that are not going to make you seem amazing, important, and uh, wow. Um, so this weekend I did a training on listening skills with a local church here. And uh, unfortunately now I'm talking about it. So now I'm just taking away, you know, all, all of the opportunity to do something that doesn't get intention. But, but I'm trying to communicate about 
doing things that are just service to others, right? Um, that are just simple. I'm not doing something amazing. Listening skills is the most basic thing. Someone with who's an undergraduate can do this kind of work. But it's so fun to be able to do it. And it's so enjoyable. And it's good for my heart to remind me that I'm just a person. I'm not something all that special. Yeah. Um, and that I can step into a local church community and sit with people who are not getting their doctorate. Right. I, I, I sat with someone who like when, you know, her husband had been in jail recently. She's in her two year sobriety of AA. You know, and she is ready to be a good listener in a ministry at her church. And um, we're working on uh, some things with that at the Church Cares uh, Project. And that is just, uh, just wow, right? This beautiful moment I sit next to somebody who's a sister in Christ and listen to a little bit of her story and help her to become a listener in her ministry that she's doing largely to people in similar situations who are you know, dealing with drug abuse, alcohol abuse, dealing with incarceration. I can't step into that role with credibility, but she can. And her life has been transformed by Jesus and a really great church that she's a part of. And so um, I'm really excited to get to just kind of be the, the, you know, the excitement to like watch what's happening there. Like I said, I come on, I say my one line in the show and then I go off and then get to watch and see all that's happening there. So I think that in integration work, if we're not doing something that's going to make the world better outside of our own career and opportunities and and uh, fame and fortune or whatever, then that's not, you know, that the way of Jesus is to do some things that, that uh, are about that. And so it's been inspiring for me to get to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any last nuggets that you want to share with us about some of the future directions you're going in your integrative work or exciting sciencey, psychology, uh, person of faith, things that you're working on? Yeah, and most of my time this year is spent on a project called The Church Cares. Um, and we are just getting going. It was largely inspired by the Knoxville um, weekend. But honest, for me, I, you know, I really was pondering that. And then Jim was pondering at the same time. And then out of nowhere, and I know it's not nowhere because God doesn't work out of nowhere. God works out of somewhere. So um, out of what felt like nowhere to us, someone gave us a grant. And here we are building something to help churches address issues of epidemics of loneliness, of mental health adolescents. We're working with Young Life and with um, ministry at, and churches. And it has just been growing and growing. And it's one of those things that we're just kind of holding on. Like, I'm like, okay, I got to take my Sabbath rest because we're, we thought we'd approach churches and we'd get like 20%. Normally you get like 20% saying, yeah, that sounds like a program we'd like to do. We've had a hundred percent response saying, yes, we need something like that. When can you start? And we're like, oh, well, okay. Okay, we got to like write the curriculum first. So hold on, you know. Um, so that's my experience this year. And um, it's really exciting. And we'll do some science in it. I'm the science girl and, and part of that and the program evaluation of it. Um, and uh, Jim is developing the, the big ideas. He's, he's great with great ideas. And so uh, it's really fun to work with a whole team of people um, to do that. So I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that and see where things go in the next coming years on that project. Yeah. Wow. A hundred percent response rate. That is. Oh, right. Incredible. You've we got to stop asking something there. Yep. Yeah. We got to stop asking people. We have to like start accounting for, we're going to get like the 90 to hundred percent response. Yes. We got to ask less people, I think, to make this work. Yeah. Well, what a testament to the powerful work that you're doing to have such a high response rate of real people in real churches wanting some real tools and resources that you can provide with them. So thank you for sharing all about the integrated work that you're doing and the person that you are, the way that you're thinking so deeply about the positions of faith that you're coming from and the question and the tools and the things that you can research and bring to the world. So thank you for sharing those. 
with us. Thank you everyone for listening to Why It Matters Integration Unraveled today with Dr. Jen Ripley. Thank you so much. Thank you.